Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Bipolar Awakenings podcast with me, Sean Blackwell. And today I'm going to be talking to a friend of mine, photographer, author, and filmmaker, Phil Borges. For nearly three decades, Phil Borges has been documenting indigenous and tribal cultures, trying to create an understanding of the challenges they face. His work is exhibited in museums and galleries around the world. Phil has hosted television documentaries on indigenous cultures and shamanism for Discovery and National Geographic channels. He regularly presents at universities, teaches workshops, and has spoken at multiple TED events. In fact, that's how I met him. I saw one of his TED Talks on YouTube many years ago. Phil's documentary film, Crazy Wise, reveals a paradigm shift that's changing the way Western culture defines and treats mental illness. After eight years and countless interviews with mental health care professionals, neuroscientists, and individuals experiencing mental health crises, Crazy Wise explores the deeper understandings of and effective approaches to a psychological crisis. Today, we're going to be talking to Phil Borges about his experience with tribal cultures and shamanism in particular, and then we're going to follow it up with a second podcast where we talk about how that background influenced his desire to create the documentary film Crazy Wise, what the film was about, and any insight he could give us that you're not going to find anywhere else. Okay, so Phil, thanks for coming. All right, Sean. Good to see you again. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. And for people who don't know, and I assume most people don't, we've known each other for a while, right? I mean, we've met at a few conferences, uh, been to your house. Yeah. I don't know how many years. It's probably been yeah. about six, seven. Six or seven years. Yeah. yeah. We've been back and forth and met here and there. It's been it's been pretty cool. And, you know, you made this amazing movie, The Crazy Wise, you know, this great movie about looking at different approaches towards the mental health system and disorders as a whole. And a lot of your inspiration, uh, just like in your description that I just read, came from your roots as a photographer of tribal cultures around the world. How did you get into that work? Um, well, first of all, why? <laughs> okay. I, and I think my roots go back to summers between the age of 11 and 14 15, I spent all my summers on a ranch, a fairly remote ranch in the 50s in Utah, in the Wasatch Range. And we basically lived off the land. We grew all oh, our really? food, we very seldomly went into town to get supplies. And so I think that's what initially attracted me to indigenous and tribal mm. people. And did you hunt there? Like, did you? Hunt game? You know, I never did get into hunting. That happened mostly mm -hmm. in the late fall. And okay. I I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I didn't like shooting animals. And I, I went on a couple of hunts, but I didn't carry a gun. I just, um, and I didn't like guns. Mm. So I, yeah, I was never really attracted to that. But um, yeah. So I didn't hunt. <laughs> okay. But that, that those roots got you interested in living with nature? Is that Yeah, I mean, I was outdoors all all the time and we were putting up hay for the animals in the winter time and growing our gardens and um and just it was just first of all, it was this little community of around 40 families that lived in this beautiful valley, Wasatch Range in the background, snow-capped mountains all summer long, um, a beautiful river that went through this valley that we swam in and fished in. And uh, it was just idyllic, the, the life I was leading then. And that was compared to where I lived the rest of the year when I went to school in the East Bay of San Francisco and it was kind of a poor neighborhood. And uh, I was getting in trouble because I had a huge firecracker business. I <laughs> fell in love with firecrackers and I was selling firecrackers and pretty soon they were illegal. And uh -huh. so that became a problem. How old and, were you when you were selling firecrackers? Pardon me? How old were you? When uh, I started when I was nine. 
<laughs> wow, entrepreneurial. Yeah, I would sure. actually make my way down to Chinatown in Oakland and go into the back of this little grocery store where this guy sold them and have to wait out on a street corner while a, while a car came by and threw out the firecrackers and I'd throw them into my paper bags on my bike and jet on back to the neighborhood. Wow. Back, back in the That's days funny. before, before helicopter parents, you know, imagine a nine year old going into Chinatown alone now. I mean, <laughs> no, never going to happen. happen. Back then you're a man about town, you know? Yeah. Well, my dad had died and my mom worked all day. So I was a latchkey kid, my sister and I. Yeah. But anyway, um, I was getting into trouble. She sent me to the ranch. It was um, our in-laws. My sister married into the family that had the ranch. And so I um, went there reluctantly, but then just totally fell in love with it. Developed this deep relationship with a horse and several of the other animals. And as, as I said, being outdoors every day, I was a hard worker, so they loved me back there. And uh, instead of getting in trouble with all my energy, I was praised. And so it, it was just this wonderful period in my life. It really saved me in a way. So one way or another, you were pretty wild at heart, you might say. Uh, I love doing new things, yeah. Okay. All right. And then I know when you got older, you worked as an orthodontist. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, for 18 yeah. years. Yeah. So, yeah. that was That's a whole other story how I got into that. Um, mm -hmm. We moved from this kind of the hood. Okay. <laughs> into an upper middle class neighborhood and we were still poor but we lived on the outskirts of it but all my friends had were given cars for their birthdays they were um they were good students which i wasn't and um i slowly over i we moved there when i was a freshman in high school over the four years of high school I slowly adapted to their values. And, and one of those was I wanted a lot of money. And uh, that's why I chose orthodontics. I had no idea what being an orthodontist was like. It was just, I knew they had good hours and they made good money. Yeah, so you weren't fascinated with teeth by any stretch of the imagination. No. Okay, no. got it. Okay. <laughs> or, or being in people's mouths, no. All right. Yeah. So 18 years selling your soul to the devil, basically, right? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that ranch was just this highlight in my growing up. And I think that's what attracted me to tribal and indigenous cultures. All right. All right. But you, you'd been doing photography before that a little bit too, right? Weren't you taking wedding photos or something? You no. Know, you know where I really got into it? I... Mm. So in the um, mid-60s, I was in dental school in San Francisco, mm -hmm. living in the Haight-Ashbury district of San Francisco. And that's where the culture... You're from Canada, so you may sure. not know this. I've so, been to Haight-Ashbury. Yeah, yeah. You know about that. So that that whole cultural explosion happened at that time. And all these summer of love. Kids, right. Summer of love. All these kids pouring into San Francisco. Well, we were living right in the middle of that. Well, I was with four other guys going to dental school. And I got a work-study job going down on the street, interviewing the hippies as to why they were sharing needles, because there was this huge hepatitis outbreak in the hate. Mm. And um, so I would just sit on the corner and get to do what I love to do is interview people, much like you're doing. <laughs> wow. So you started interviewing people about why they're sharing needles in the 60s. Yes. Yes. Okay. And then I, they were so colorful, you know, everybody's growing their hair and wearing all these new clothes that, you know, it was just this whole cultural shift. Mm -hmm. And I started taking, I 
bought a little Minolta SRT 101, one of the first single lens reflex cameras and started taking photos of the hippies. So I, I basically, <laughs> now that I think of it, was doing what I ended up doing around the world in tribes back then. Wow. Just, did, you see, did you see yourself as a hippie at the time? Like, were you one no, of them or were you an outside school. observer? I was You're in dental school. school. But I definitely had that mindset of, you know, I, I, I really envied them at the time. Here I was in dental school in this rigid program, you know, working, you know, very hard, this hard curriculum. And these kids were out free um, in the park all day, you know, getting high and, you know, it was... I was very locked down, more or less. Okay. But sort of but, living vicariously through them a little bit. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I got to see, but I mean, I saw the downside of it too. You know, mm. they, it, it, it wasn't the summer of love turned into a murder in the hate district every day. One person was murdered every day by wow. the time I left. And it was like you could see the drugs changing from pot and LSD to cocaine and methamphetamines and heroin and that whole, yeah. So it was an unsustainable lifestyle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The other thing that was unsustainable, a lot of people wanted to form communes back then, but that's the other interesting thing that I've reflected upon. Communes, most of them failed. And, you know, we're a very individualistic society. We're a society of individuals. In fact, I think of America as the cult of the individual. We, we um, you know, we worship celebrity, individual accomplishment, status, and... Uh, and that's very different than the way tribal people live. I mean, they have to be totally engaged with, they have to work as a single organism in a way, just to survive. They have to be responsible for each other and um, they can't allow disharmony within the group. Disharmony. They're yeah, and people, you know, we as humans, we all have differences and we have to work out those differences. But in our society, we don't have to work them out anymore. We can buy a lawyer to solve our arguments. <laughs> we don't need um, the people around us to feed us. If we've made enough money, we can buy daycare. We can buy old age homes. We can, you know, we have social security. We don't need those individual tight relationships in order to survive. Survive, any yeah. Longer. yeah. Yeah, and so how did you get out there into the into the wilderness, into the wild, filming these people? You were working almost like an anthropologist, you know? Um, in a way, but my whole focus was human rights. That's what I was very interested in is because these tribes are disappearing. And it's like 15 years ago, I had this statistic from MIT um, that there's 3,000 languages currently spoken on earth and half of them are not spoken by the children. So in a generation, our cultural diversity will be cut in half. And, and so it's, it's this silent extinction going on. And I, I really wanted to um, bring to light the challenges tribal and indigenous people face. That was why I was going out there. But at the same time, I got to see how people lived um, how people were living and the way we lived, you know, millennia ago and how we lived when our brains were developing over a 200,000 year period of time. 
in these small hunter-gatherer groups. And I, I, I really, you know, the thing I came away with, Sean, is how relatively disconnected we are from each other, from the environment, and, and from ourselves. And so that kind of, um, well, how it led into the mental health world is by chance I started meeting the healers and visionaries in those in the communities I was in and learned that they were selected in their youth by having what we would call a mental illness, a, a psychological crisis. Right. And let me let me slow you down a little bit because I'd like to get a little bit of detail. Could you tell me a little bit about the first tribe where you encountered shamanism? And and maybe maybe giving you a little bit of background. I think a lot of people, especially like myself, my wife, we've had a lot of contact with what I would call new age shamanism. Mm. And uh, you know, out of Sedona and places like that. I've been to Peru, I've met shamans, Incan shamans, but even those shamans have a lot of tourist contact, you know. They know how Westerners think a little bit and they've modified their ways, you know, but your experience has been very unique because ha have you been like the first white person some of these people have seen or no, or you no, know, and not that level, huh? No, okay. no, no. Okay. Um, in fact, it, it can be very dangerous to do that. Um, in Irian Jaya, I came close to that West Papua New Guinea. Um, mm. Uh, but no. Is that the other half of the island or is that New uh, Guinea? So, yeah. Papua New Guinea, there's the western half is owned, is governed by Indonesia. Okay. So, and it's, it was called Irian Jaya and now it's called West Papua. Oh, okay. It's West Papua New Guinea. Yeah. All right. All right. And so, yeah, tell me a little bit about going down there. What was that like for you? Well, if you want to know the first time I um, encountered a healer or a shaman or a visionary. Sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> that wasn't down there. Um, hmm. That was actually um, in uh, a little town, Dharamsala, India, where the Dalai Lama has escaped to. You know, the Dalai Lama sure. leave Tibet in 1959. He lives in this little town. Dharamsala, India. Mm -hmm. So the first time I really saw what we call sham, a shaman, uh, mm -hmm. what the Tibetans call a kutin. By the word, right. by the way, that word shaman was comes from the um, healers and visionaries in Siberia. Right. They were called right. sama. And we've mm -hmm. adopted that term. But this term in each and every tribe, they 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 go by a different name, right? So in Tibet, they're known as a kutin. Okay, and a kutin is somebody that goes into a non ordinary state of consciousness. They induce it, and what we would call channel the spirits and actually start speaking through this spirit energy. So the first time I ever saw this happen was in Dharamsala in a monastery. And there was a 30-year-old monk who was a Kutin who went into trance. And he they induced it by putting him in this elaborate robe with this huge hat on his head. Um, he was in a room of about 40 monks. It's called the Nechung Monastery. And he was channeling the Nechung Oracle, which is the protect, protector spirit of the Tibetan people. And the monks started chanting. They also beat drums and they blow these horns. And it, it, they it kind of got into this kind of cacophony of sound and just really loud. 
And I was there with a friend doing a story on the Nechung Oracle for uh, the London Daily Telegraph. And that's how I got there. He invited me to go. And they put this heavy hat on the Kutin's head while they were chanting. And his eyes rolled back and he started speaking in this very high pitched voice. And they started writing down everything. And then he collapsed and they had to carry him out of the room. He was unconscious. It looked mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. And so it was just, <laughs> it looked like a theatrical performance to me at the time. Well, speaking of being theatrical, I mean, I the scene you've described, I've seen in the movie, I believe it's called Kundun. It was mm -hmm. a Martin Scorsese movie. And what you just described is exactly what they showed. I from haven't Kutin. seen the movie before. But, oh, okay. Yeah. And he collapses and they carried him out. It was very, yeah. very powerful. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, two days. So I was with Mick Brown, this journalist from the Daily Telegraph, and he was invited to go in and interview the Kutin after we saw this. And that was about two days later. And one of the questions he asked him is, how did you become the Kutin? Mm -hmm. And he essentially described a psychological crisis, as far as I could tell, hearing voices, having these wild mood swings and personality changes, also having this um, electrical jolt go up his spine and he felt like it exploded in his head. And, okay. and another thing he said that I've interviewed several healers since that time. Mm -hmm. um, and I've heard this over and over again. He thought he was dying. Right. He, yeah. And, uh, and they, the older monks um, noticed that in their view, he had a special sensitivity, a sensitivity that they could use. Uh, and they do, they use the Kutin to, help them decide certain issues. And um, for instance, the Dalai Lama, um, when he had to escape to Tibet, the, it was the Kutin who told them that the Chinese government was about to assassinate him. And that's when they snuck him out dressed as a peasant and he had to go out over the Himalayas, down into Nepal and then over to Dharamsala, mm -hmm. 30 day journey. So they use him, and we. The Dalai Lama has been asked, "Do you really rely on the Kutin for your decisions of state?" You know, he's still the leader of the Tibetan people, and they will do anything he says. That he's highly revered, probably more than any other leader in the world. Yeah, probably. And. Um, he just said, you know, if we completely relied on the Kutin for our um, decisions, that would be extreme. But if we completely ignored the Kutin, that would be extreme. So they do use this balance of rational mind and decision making and what the Kutin says. Yeah, very, very interesting. And uh, I believe the Kutin uh, from the movie how to escape Tibet was told through the Oracle as well. And the Oracle told uh, the Dalai Lama, he needed to take a, 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 a trail that would have been impossible, but they trusted the Kutin, they went, and then the trail was completely free. There, there were supposed to be Chinese soldiers there and there weren't. And yeah. they were able to escape following his psychic advice. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And now you've taken a pretty famous photo of the Dalai Lama right? Yeah. I'll, I'll ask permission this time to post it in the video. But did, did you know that, you know, with all of this, and, and it's all brings a different perspective. Did you know that the Dalai Lama's brother had bipolar disorder? Yeah, I did. Yeah. And yeah. he, he takes medication for that disorder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Know? What do you make of that? You know, um, I don't know if he still takes medication, but I, I know he did for a period of time. Um, it's, it's like uh, there's no one size fits all in the world of mental health. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, 
the we, we can get into what I think about taking medications later, I guess. But for right now, um, I believe medications are being way over prescribed, way overused in our in our culture, in our in Western society. And suppression of symptoms is sometimes necessary if mm -hmm. they're too extreme and the person's in danger. But it was much more preferable to get to the root of what's causing the distress and, and try to um, gain some meaning out of what that distress is telling the person. And, and see if you can solve the, the imbalances in their environment or in their way of thinking that's causing that or the way in their, basically in their relationships with themselves, with other people and with the world, with the environment. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, it's necessary in some cases, in many cases, but um, there's also deeper work to be done usually to sure. solve the problem. Yeah, yeah, that's why we're talking, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's how we met. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what happened in Papua New Guinea? In Irian Jaya. Irian Jaya. Yeah. yeah. Um, a lot of things happened uh -huh. <laughs> along red lines. <laughs> red lines, as in red lines were crossed? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was still learning how to go into remote areas when I went to Papua New Guinea mm -hmm. and how to select a guide, basically. Okay. And for my work, the most important thing in a guide is that they have people skills. And I learned the hard <laughs> way, and I did learn this in New Guinea, that just because a person has learned a little bit of English in a, in a tribe or in a group, doesn't mean they're going to be a good guide because often they get arrogant. They think, man, oh. I know English now and these, everybody else doesn't. I can be the big, big shot here. And, and the people around them, the people that you're trying to interview, pick that up and they don't like it. Mm. So what I did in New Guinea was test drove my, the, people I would choose to be my guides. And the first person I chose almost caused a little riot because anytime, and I was doing these kind of studio portraits out in the wild. I had a portable light battery operated and all that. And a crowd would gather. And especially if you're in the little, we were in this little town of Wamina and we were, on the outskirts and we tried to get away from where there's a lot of people, but mm -hmm. nevertheless, as you're setting up and doing an interview and taking a picture, a crowd would gather. And okay. the first guide I selected almost caused a riot. I mean, I literally had to pack up while they were arguing and fighting and get out of there. So finding somebody that's good with people. What, what did he do? Do you he, know what did he say? I don't know what he said. They're speaking in their language, but he irritated him. Okay, he was just annoying. Yeah, so I found somebody that didn't do that. That was really mm. good with people. Anyway, his name was Onus. He put together uh, five or six porters, and I thought, wow, this is excessive for what I have to carry. But we went out for four weeks, and so we had to carry all our food. And and uh, um, they insisted on carrying eggs because they thought Americans loved eggs. And I thought, this carrying is eggs? Cherry eggs, yeah. Through the jungle. And no, th this is really mountainous, too. You're the sliding. Papua on New Guinea hillside. Oh. Yeah. Um, anyway. How well, comfortable? How comfortable? Yeah. How comfortable were you in those kind of environments? Because I imagine that's one of the most hostile places on the planet to be visiting, camping. Not not really hostile. I mean, you know, 
hostile in terms of weather. No, it was kind of summertime and it was okay. It was wet and slippery and some places were hard to climb. But (laughs) one thing um, that really amazed me on our first night out, we, we, hiked for about eight or 10 hours and I was totally exhausted and they're carrying all my stuff. Sure. You know, I'm carrying my camera. That's it. And one of the porters um, decided he had left his pocket knife back where we started. Mm -hmm. And as we went to bed that night, he took off in the middle of the night and showed up the next morning with the pocket knife. (laughs) Wow. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he God. doubled what I did to totally exhaust me in the <laughs> night, barefooted. Wow. But, How old were you when you did this trick? Yeah, I was in my 50s. You're in your 50s somewhere. Okay. And uh, what what did you learn about the culture there that influenced you? Oh, just, again, um, you know, so I, I usually do this with pictures <laughs> sure, it's okay. Um, so um, I can put some pictures if you want. A young girl outside of this. They live in these round, thatched tents. Basically, okay. it looks like a yurt. It looks like a right, like a Mongolian yurt. Yurt, Big tent. yes. Yeah. Only about I'd say twenty to twenty-five feet in diameter. Okay, and the whole family lives in this. And when I say family, I mean extended right. family. And the Brazilian tribes are like that too. They live in these big ocas, which are just like a giant tent in, in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. So in this particular one where I show the picture of this young girl who's looking like she's mourning something, her great grandmother was dying when I was there. And so in that, in that 25 foot space, lived her great-grandma, her grandparents, um, four of them, uh, her six brothers and sisters, an orphan kid they adopted, the parents, a couple of aunts and uncles. There were like 22 people living in that tent, and they all slept inside. And I spent the night with them. And you soon learn there's no privacy. (laughs) You know, what we've come to demand in our lives in terms of privacy, they don't have that. They're constantly in contact with one another. And I've had um, times when I've wanted to go in. In fact, then I wanted to set up my own to have go out and have Onus set up a tent for me and, and sleep in the tent. Um, and if I did that, they would think I was mad at them. You know, any alone time, they don't, don't get much alone time. They're always interacting. And it isn't like, if you have an argument with somebody, if you have a disagreement, which we all do as human beings, you don't get to just take off and throw that person out of your life. You have to deal with it. And if you can't, the tribe will gather and help those people that have that issue work it out. So that's one of the things we've lost. We've really lost the ability to work through difficulties. You know, we hire it out. We hire lawyers to solve our disagreements. But now I, I, I put you on the spot when we met in uh, one of the crazy wise conferences about this though. And I'm curious for your feedback here. If, if we, if you don't want it in the interview, we can take it out. Okay. But, okay. I'm curious because, you know, Papua New Guinea is a place on the planet where uh, ritualized cannibalism can happen. And I believe it can still happen. Usually when somebody is accused of sorcery or or witchcraft, they're Mm. accused of killing somebody through sorcery, which apparently they believe is a common thing. Like anybody who dies, it's like somebody did this to them. 
Were you familiar with that aspect? Did yeah. were you in contact with any of that? And and yeah. how do you yeah, feel about I, that? I, I've seen it. I mean, I've been very close to it happening. Really? Uh, not in Papua New Guinea, but in uh, Takungu, Kenya, which is out on the Indian Ocean. Really? Um, so I had, yeah, that, let me just back up and say, yes, that happens. But it's mm-hmm. almost, that can happen within the shamanic world black the black arts the dark arts of sure putting a curse on somebody versus uh-huh. trying to heal somebody and where that's prevalent um the shamans are in grave danger because anytime your child gets sick or your animals get sick you can blame it on the the shaman right and, right and i did this one trip down this river um in the Amazon from Ecuador into Peru. And we were crossing this river that hadn't been crossed in 60 years because Ecuador and Peru were kind of at war with one another. Okay. And Fujimori, the president of Peru at the time, opened it, the, the border up. And so I thought, wow, this is going to be great. And this was on a National Geographic trip. We're going to see shamanism that has been untouched by Westerners coming down to do ayahuasca and all that that's going on now. Mm-hmm. And we got in there and found out all the shaman had been killed. Wow. They had, um, you know, they, a lot of dark arts were being practiced. And, and so where I got the closest to that is in this little village of Takungu, Kenya, and I had a program called Bridges to Understanding where photographers wanted to travel with me to see how I made contact with people and how I got the portraits I got. And I found when I was doing those workshops, it was very hard to teach somebody in a two to three week workshop how mm-hmm. to do that. So I started and I wanted to help indigenous people tell their own stories, not have me go in and put together what I see from my point of view. And so I started this program called Bridges. So we would take a group of around 14 to 16 photographers into a community, pair up with a bunch of teenagers, usually in a class setting, and ask them, what story around an environmental or social issue would you like to tell? And altogether, we would put together a movie out of the stills and we would record sounds and their voiceovers and put together a movie. So we decided in Takungu to do it on the subject of water. And in Takungu, there's um, one third Muslim, one third animist, one third Christian living there. Okay. So we did the story of water from each one of those points of view. And with the Christians, it was a baptism we, we filmed. They baptized in the Indian Ocean. With the um, uh, animist, it was a shaman who did a rain ceremony to bring in rain. They were in a drought. And so we filmed her as she did this elaborate ceremony to call in the rain. And by the way, it did rain the next day. Okay. (laughs) Good work. It was amazing. But when we got back from that trip and I, our fixer over there, the person who helped us organize everything was a Peace Corps volunteer that had stayed on and lived in that little village. Mm-hmm. And she, I'll never forget when I, um, when we contacted, um, she called me two weeks later after I got home and said, I've got some bad news for you. The Munganga, uh, which that's the name for their shaman, the Muganga, okay. was murdered last night. Somebody mm-hmm. hacked her to death, to death with a machete. Wow. And it was a family that thought she had, cursed them. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So that does happen. 
Mm-hmm. And, um, but what I was trying to say about the intimate, profound connections people have to one another in these small groups uh, is still there. And that type of thing, is, I, I don't think it's that common, but it does happen. Uh, right. What, what does happen, though, in tribal communities, like in the lower Omo Valley of, the, of Ethiopia, there's 14 tribes living like they have for millennia. It's changing now because it's starting to get more touristed, but um, they, um, within the tribe, very tight, um, uh, you know, everybody's got to work together to ensure their survival. But outside the tribe, those are enemies. So their circles of compassion are confined to the tribe. I'm a little confused. You've got multiple tribes. Yeah. And they are enemies of each other, but in certain situations they work together, they collaborate? Or am I getting this wrong? I, let's put it this way. Um, the main intimate connections are within the tribe. Uh-huh. Outside that tribe is the other, and they could be at war. It's much like we are with countries oh, okay. now. We're not sure. at war with every country right now. We're kind of at war with the Soviet, I mean, the Russian. Sure. And but, usually we don't like the neighbor, you know, like the Brazilians don't like the Argentinians, the Canadians roll their eyes at the Americans. <laughs> yeah. You know, everybody, right. you know, well, we, you, defi- we, you define yourself in relation to the other, you know, well, we're not like yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, mm-hmm. Then that's, uh, you know, that's a deep, issue with us human beings we want to tribalize and right Mm -hmm. now in america we're tribalizing around conspiracy theories we're tribalizing around our sports teams you know around our religion Mm -hmm. and um yeah we want to belong to a tribe we want to belong to people like us and, sure, sure. And and we others others and demonize them at times. So, mm-hmm. and that well, you know on the small levels. But again, within the tribe, they have something that we have lost. Right, right. And and I think this this conversation is very important because today I think that left wing people, postmodern people. There tends to be a bit of a disnification of tribal society, like oh, we've lost everything. Only if only we live like the tribes, you know. But from your experience, and and this is what I try and communicate in my videos too, is that almost from every culture there can be really something valuable. And one thing that you're talking about here is the value of intimate connection and community, which we've largely lost, right? Yeah. And that's really important. But that doesn't necessarily mean that these people are, you know, singing and dancing through the jungle every day. I mean, tribal life can be brutal and tough and they have enemies. Yeah. You know, I I always remember the movie Avatar because all of the, the, that, that Avatar, that tribe, the Navi, Navi, the Navi tribe, they're, you know, going around on their magic horses or whatever the hell they're riding. And they're all strong, tough warriors. Who are they fighting? Who, who, where was the enemy? There was no enemy there. It was just this land of peace and harmony with a bunch of warriors. It didn't quite make sense, you know? And then the Americans arrived while well, they finally had someone to fight, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They've been waiting for this, fight, ready to fight these people that they don't even know exist. But, I mean, tribal men tend to be warriors. I mean, that tends to be the main function. Yeah. Right? Hunters and warriors and protect the tribe. Protect against the, tribe the other tribe. the outside. Yeah. The outside forces. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we in America have been successful in bringing several tribes together. You know, all these yeah. European tribes. And, mm-hmm. and so, no, I'm not saying that we can go back to be living like that was, I mean, we've developed so many things that we have now. I mean, when I come home after being, just about anywhere, um, say the Tibetan Plateau, 
They're eating yak yogurt, yak hard, hard <laughs> rock cheese, um, butter tea, um, salty, you know, rancid butter in the tea. Um, no vegetables. Mm. Uh, Sampa, which is barley flour, and that's it. You come home, you get to walk into a Whole Foods grocery store, and yeah. <laughs> you got everything. Mm -hmm. um, so it's and complain when there's no lactose-free milk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, Phil. Oh. I remember. I remember when we met in Prague for this conference, and I mean, the food in this hotel was just awful. I mean, the egg yolks were green in the boiled eggs. I mean, it was that bad. And then you were just like, well, some tribes only have two foods, you know? <laughs> Stop complaining, Sean. No tribe in Africa, they just drink cow's blood all day. That's their that's their thing. I'm like, thanks, Phil, for humbling me in this moment, you know? Yeah. And You're, but... You're comfortable out there, though. Like, you just get out there with your porters and you camp for a month and you're at home. I can't say I'm at home. I'm at home right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have a nice um, house. You know, it. it's hard. It's difficult at times. I mean, but it's totally fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean... It's taught me so much about the importance of connections, connections to each other, connections to the environment. That's the other thing. They know the environment like they're the PhDs of the environment. Right. right we right. are just scratching the surface on what we know about the environment compared to many of these tribal people. And that's one of the big um, uh catastrophes that's going on with tribal extinction is it's like burning down a library when the last elder speaking the language dies um, because they're unwritten I mean mm -hmm. many of the languages are not written and so, when, what, oh go ahead um, I could give you example upon example of <laughs> how I was just fascinated by what they knew Oh, about the land and this kind of thing? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll just tell you one. Sure. Okay. Because it saved my life, really. Really? I, you know, I in the lower Omo, again, where there's the 14 tribes, mm -hmm. I was with the Hammer tribe at that point. Anyway, we went down. So to get water, you go down the lower Omo, and the, the river, the Omo River, and take a bucket and and get it. And the water is kind of the consistency of thick chocolate milk. Okay. It's got all this colloidal suspension of mud in it. Like Evian, and, in yeah. other words. <laughs> yes. And so I would take the bucket up to my tent and let it sit. And hopefully in the morning I could get my prayer filter and filter some water. Okay. Um, so I went down there to get some water and it was with two 11 year old kids, 10, 11 year old kids. And I went to get the water and the kid grabs my arm and he points out, and yeah, sure enough, here's two little round brown bubbles coming out of the, the river. You know, these crocodile are 24 feet long and they're fast. They'll grab things on the shore. Okay. But anyway, pulls me back, points to it. And finally he takes me to where I could get a bucket of water. <laughs> So there's yeah, alligators the right kids. in the mud, right where you're going to put your hand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this kid saved me okay. and shows me where to get the water. And I get a bucket full. And he goes over to this kind of willow-like looking tree, takes and with his knife serrates the bark on it, mm -hmm. puts it in the bucket, stirs it, and the mud settled out just like that. I have no idea. I, I, you know, I brought one of these branches home to the University of Washington here to the botany department to see if they knew what it was and what it could have been. But it was all dried out by the time I got here. So Man. there was something, something about that branch that was purifying the water, the, the muddy was water. Was allowing the mud to precipitate out 
Of, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. It didn't purify. It just let all the mud settle to the mm-hmm. bottom. And, mm-hmm. you know, just things like that, that mm-hmm. they know and we don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I remember your sense of adventure at that Prague conference because we had been doing some interviews together with, with some psychologists at the conference for three days. And by the time I was done with the last interview, I was just absolutely exhausted, spent the night in bed. And I found out that you went out with a guy at the conference who was actually in a manic episode and you were out walking Prague, downtown Prague until four o'clock in the morning. (laughs) And I was like, my God, how does he do that? Like, (laughs) this is why he can go out and stay with these people in Africa and the tribes and everything in these, you know, rustic circumstances. No, I need my sleep, but I just, I, I was with Nick. Yeah. And I've gotten to know Nick quite well. Mm-hmm. And interesting guy, by the way. Yeah, yeah mutual friend. Yeah, I mean, I know Nick as well. Brilliant yeah. and, mm-hmm. and and still troubled. He he opens. He had an opening like you did, you know? Sure, and, sure. And, and he had uh, he had a stutter so bad he couldn't get a couple of words out until his psychotic break. And right. after that, his stutter went away, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which I found. And I've heard that from other people too. Yeah. He's told um, me that story. Yeah. And in his words, and I've heard this from several other people, I don't know if you would say this, mm. but my crisis was one of the hardest things I ever went through, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. I've heard that statement many, many times. Mm-hmm. Would you well, say that, Sean? I've certainly spoke. I just my most recent interview talked about her bipolar disorder as a blessing, you know. Mm. So I think that there are certainly gifts that can come up, and if it's handled properly, or if a person is given a, a, an orientation to the meaning of their psychosis, right, that then they can really bring forward the gifts of the crisis. Yeah. They can really do it. But if it ends up like, okay, the first your first night in your non ordinary state, you spend uh, handcuffed to a hospital bed and put in isolation and then forcibly injected, and then you're being told you're going to be medicated for life, then the whole thing becomes traumatizing. And future episodes often feel almost like a broken record. It's just the same thing happening over and over and over again. Mm. But mm. if if you steer it in that other direction, you know, like we we had a guy, you know, you were talking about the Dalai Lama's um, Kutin, right? Kutin. Channeling spirits. And one of our clients here in Brazil, he got involved in the Ubanda religion down here in Brazil, where they channel spirits, right? So this is a guy who he did, uh, by the way, he worked for like a, one of these Wall Street brokerages, you know, like down here in Brazil, highly educated guy, had 10 years of talk therapy before his first manic episode. I told him I thought he should get his money back. Um, <laughs> but he did two retreats with us and mm-hmm. talk therapy with my wife, Lisa, once a week. But he was also doing uh, channeling spirits through the Ubanda religion where they channel um, African Orishas, Orishas, I guess we channel, call it. And he was doing that as well. And he was able in, uh, he went off his medication after about six months after working with us, he went off his medication entirely. He Then he went into a manic episode and we knew, we knew we were talking to him. And so we knew that he was going, you know, he's up there. And then he explained it to me that he was in the countryside one night And he just decided, I got to do something here. And he was in his own house alone. And he got, I believe he got down on the floor. And then he just had this huge heart explosion. And he started screaming and yelling. And then like the whole thing passed. And he got himself grounded. A heart explosion? Like like a a burst of energy coming from the heart chakra. Mm. So like a kundalini thing. Okay. Not so different than what your kundun, your uh, curtain experience, kundalini experience, energy coming mm-hmm. through. And 
that explosion that he surrendered to mm. got him grounded again. Mm. So, and he's the only person I've met that has been able to go, he's going manic, unmedicated, and then he got himself grounded alone with no help. Um, after having multiple episodes, he's really the first one. And so I know that it was a mix, not only of the therapeutic work we did with him, but of his Ubanda experience of channeling spirits, going into those non-ordinary states and, um, and just learning how to, how to work with these energies, you know? But yeah. Um, yeah. And he kind of did it on his own with your completely alone. The, the, the final part was completely alone. Wow. Although we had had two guided retreats with him. Yeah. Yeah. So that probably she, gave him enough to be able to do it. Right. Yeah. I, but, I mean, but I think his Ubanda helped too. I think the channeling the spirits from the Ubanda yeah. religion helped. Um, and, but, and therapy helped too. Yeah. Go ahead. All the things you started off with, being handcuffed and injected and taken to the emergency room. That's all because of misunderstanding in our culture, right? That's the way I see it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't really understand. I think, well, we're doing modern society is doing the best that modern society can do, but modern society is only focused on a few things which help put a roof over our head and give us this amazing technology to do this interview. But emotionally and spiritually, we're still really underdeveloped, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know? And, and the tribes like you've been in contact with, they've, they've certainly got a much more intimate contact with the spiritual dimension that we do. Yeah. Even though I think that we see it, the spiritual dimension in kind of an inverted way. Like for example, all tribes have this idea of black magic and sorcery. Um, that I, that I'm aware of until they develop a little bit more. That's always there with tribes that I've seen or read about. And and once people sort of go postmodern, they sort of even deny that aspect. Well, that's not really authentic spirituality, or you know, it's all about peace and love and all that kind of thing. And 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 that's certainly what we're cultivating. But it's not all that's there, and certainly not for tribes. For tribes, it's a very real concern: evil spirits. Um, having a curse put on you and things like that can be a, a genuine, you know, risk, right? You know, I I um I did this one show for Discovery down in the Ecuadorian Amazon with the Rwani tribe, and in that area there's another tribe, the Kofan, and there's a guy that lives in it. You can Google his name. Um, <laughs> If I forget it, I'll be amazed. Uh, Randy Borman. Anyway, Randy was born to missionary parents in the um, Peruvian Amazon, in the Ecuadorian Amazon, I believe. And I met him when he was in his mid 50s, when we were doing a show down there uh, with the Rwani on our way to get to the Rwani. Anyway, so. He ended up marrying a native woman whose father was a shaman. So I, I thought he'd be the perfect person to ask. I said, what is your feeling about the power of Christianity versus shamanism? He said, uh, there's no doubt about the power of shamanism. And I've seen it over and over again. We'll do a ceremony when we were low on food, I think he said. And next morning, 50 wild pigs ran through the camp here and we got our food. Um, and I've seen, he also said, I've seen young kids, like 16, 18 years old, being cursed and die in a day or two. He said, Christianity is a very dilute form of what it once was. That's, that's the way he looked at it. But... Um, yeah, he's known as the Gringo Chief. You, again, you can Google him. He's all over the Internet. Um, but, yeah, I mean, when I first was going into tribes, I was thinking, you know, a lot of superstition, magical thinking. But I've come around to see the value in it. You know, the um, 
this connection with the world of spirit. There's spirits in the rivers, in the mountains, in the forests, in the animals. And they honor those spirits and, and, and make um, offerings to them uh, a lot. You know, they'll, at the dinner table, they'll set aside a certain amount of food for their ancestors. And so they have this spiritual connection. And, and we say, oh, spirits and mountains. And then, yeah, what's that all about? But it's a way of connecting, reconnecting to the natural world, which we have become disconnected from. This, this leads into a whole other conversation about the fact that uh, our individual self, this thing that we honor so much in Western society is an illusion. It's a, it's a cognitive construct in our brains. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We are part of everything in a very fundamental and profound sense. And we become kind of blinded to that through our ego, <laughs> through our sense of self as an individual separate from the whole. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there's a very famous Einstein quote about that that I usually quote. Go ahead. I don't know if I could do it. We individuals, we humans tend to think of ourselves as separate from the whole we call the universe. This is actually an optical delusion of our consciousness. A delusion that's a prison for us is like a prison for us. Our task is to free ourselves from that prison by widening our circle of compassion to include all humans and the whole of the universe or something to that effect. That is an ex <laughs> that's the essence, but that isn't a, it exactly. And knowing you? you are one of the few people that I feel like really lives that way. You know, like when, when you say these things, I know you live that way because I've seen you have lunch. I've seen you say hello to people. I've seen you donate an entire weekend to my little film project that we were working on, you know, and not ask for a dime. I mean, um, you know, it comes through, Phil. It really does. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to talk to my wife? <laughs> In part two of my interview with Phil, we talk about how his experience with tribes led to the development of his film, Crazy Wise, as well as the shamanic aspects of my own healing practice. 